Hi, Kinesiology 4120. Welcome back for our next section on program design. Today, we're going to talk about speed, agility, quickness, and plyometrics. Okay, so um, we'll go through each of this, this SAQP. So speed, agility, quickness, plyometrics. What are the difference? What are the, the safety concerns, technical concerns? And then we're going to get into some, some methods of how to program and how to include these types of training within uh, our program design uh, because they are very specific to most uh, field and court sports uh, require a lot of these different techniques and patterns um, so we'll get into a little bit more on how to implement them and, and some more technical stuff we'll go more in depth in the technique into our lab but first off speed speed is the ability to move at high velocities and in multiple directions agility is our ability to change direction. Um, so being able to stop and go again in multiple different planes with um, not just moving on the ground, but moving in, in space. And quickness involves both speed and agility within a reaction component. Um, so really quickness is what is the determination in sport, uh, ability to react to some kind of external stimulus, either the defense, the offense, a ball, a puck, uh, moving somewhere in space, being able to reorient yourself and then move as fast as possible. Plyometrics, on the other hand, is, is kind of a generalized term now for really a rapid eccentric into a rapid concentric action. So think of like in this, this image of a drop jump. Um, so it's a rapid eccentric loading into a rapid concentric contraction. Um, so that transition phase is going to be a key point that we talk about there. Um, but plyometric activities fall into things like sprinting, jumping, changing directions, all have this similar plyometric activity. Um, so when we talk about speed itself, we look at both extremity speed and locomotion speed. Okay, extremity speed is the ability to move our limbs at high rates of speed. Most extremity speed activities incorporate some kind of rotation component from the torso. Um, so we're transferring force from the ground, rotating, so moving from maybe a frontal plane, like a pitching, where you're moving frontal plane, transitioning into sagittal plane. Uh, soccer, where you're moving sagittal plane, turning into a more uh, frontal plane, using that transverse plane motion um, to almost whip the extremity at high rates of speed. Then we also have locomotion speed, which is traveling. Think of this as, as traveling within space. So we have running, um, skating, swimming, um, any activity where we are transferring our body through space um, as rapidly as possible. Um, when it comes specifically to locomotion, we have things like sprinting, backpedaling, lateral movements, multiplanar movements. Most speed for locomotion based, um, we're going to talk about running speed. Um, so we can do that in, in multiple different movements or think about it as ground speed uh, rather than things like swimming or skating. Um, for this class, we'll mostly talk about land-based because that's where most of our strength and conditioning training will be. Um, we have sprinting, backpedaling, lateral movements, and then multiplanar movements. So this is our ability to linearly move forward, linearly move backwards, move in the frontal plane, either to the right or to the left, or to mix and match those planes. So being able to do things like curvilinear running, like you'd see running around the bases in, in baseball or softball, um, things where we are turning while we're moving um, are more multiplanar movements where we have that transverse plane as well as a, a sagittal plane movement. Uh, then we have two different components within each of those, which are acceleration and maximal velocity. Acceleration is our ability to change our velocity and maximum velocities as fast as we can possibly move. Um, so acceleration components are more often seen in most, especially smaller court or field sports. Um, we rarely see maximal velocity running in, in, in court or field sports, um, except for sports like maybe soccer or rugby, um, where you have time and space to move up to maximal velocity. But most sports are played within the acceleration component. Um, Otherwise, track, we, we do have maximum velocity where we're moving as fast as we can linearly. Um, Backpedaling is seen in most field and court sports, um, especially when playing a defensive position. Um, 
So backpedaling gives us the opportunity to visually react to whatever's occurring, um, especially based on the offense, and able to position our body to then transition into another movement pattern. We also see lateral movements. So this is frontal plane movements. It's all about giving our eyes the ability to see what is going on and then being able to transfer our body in space. Um, we can never move as fast laterally or in a back pedal motion as we can in a straight ahead sprint, uh, but it does give us the opportunity to change directions and alter our body position for the sport involved. Um, and then multiplanar movements, think about cutting, turning, um, curved running, things like that, where we're not just sprinting, we're not just laterally moving, we're not just backpedaling, but we are, we are transferring these motions within space. Okay, now let's get a little deeper into the components of speed. Now the first one being acceleration. Acceleration, especially moving from absolute zero velocity or no speed um, into progressing that speed up to maximal velocity. It takes about 20 to 30 meters um, upwards to 40 meters, especially around 30 for most elite athletes to get to maximal velocity from a dead stop. Um, acceleration has slightly different mechanics compared to maximal velocity if we're looking at sprinting itself. Um, but acceleration is going to be our key component for training uh, for most of our athletes because that's the difference maker, our ability to move from one velocity or one motion to another motion and to increase the velocity of that motion very quickly uh, normally means we're going to win or lose uh, that matchup. Um, so our ability to get off of a line, to start our movement, and then to increase the velocity in a very short period of time. Um, but the mechanics between maximal and acceleration-based sprinting are very different. Um, Acceleration-based sprinting is very piston-like. Uh, so we have this forward lean, as well as this piston motion of more of a push into the ground, driving both down and backwards. Um, I'm going to include more activities like this within our, our lab, so we have some, some more visuals. And then maximum velocity sprinting is much more of a cyclical action, um, where we are pushing more vertically into the ground, so pushing straight down into the ground, and then using the momentum of our thigh moving forward, to help us maintain that velocity. So sprint or acceleration-based sprinting is a lot about force production into the ground, um, while maximum velocity sprinting is a lot about swing phase momentum or that, that swing leg moving forward and then vertical force production. Um, I know that sounds like a lot, but we'll get into some more examples of exactly what that means. Um, agility is our ability to change directions. Um, there are some major components within agility um, the first is deceleration um, ability or deceleration strength uh, when it comes to agility. Your ability to slow your motion or to completely stop your motion in one direction. The faster you can stop, the faster you can begin moving in the opposite direction. The next point is body orientation. Uh, how we orient our hips or pelvis and our torso are going to influence our ability to not just stop, uh, but to control our posture and then to redirect our motion. We always want to align our body with the direction of where our force is being applied. Um, so in this example here that you can see, this athlete is driving into the ground at an angle uh, about 45 degrees to the ground. He also has his body tilted so that his force production into the ground is in line through his center of mass. If he were to shift his torso over that other limb, he would not be able to slow his body, but he could also not produce force into the ground to redirect himself. He would likely fall over. Um, so how we can orient our body, it requires a level of strength, especially around the torso um, and the hips to position our body correctly. The next strength components is our stability, which goes from our ankle, our hip, and our torso. So our ability to control our ankle motion. So if you see in this athlete, he's controlling his ankle motion. So it is in line through the rest of his leg. Um, if we are not able to stabilize the ankle joint, we may roll the ankle, we, we may move it, um, invert or evert the ankle, 
which is going to bleed out our force production as well as likely cause some kind of injury. Uh, we also have stability of the hip, being able to control the knee in between the hip and the ankle. Uh, the ankle is very mobile, the hip is very mobile, but the knee is not. Uh, so we have to stabilize that knee in between those two mobile joints using the hip and the ankle. And then our torso being able to not lean too far forward, lean to the side, rotate um, and control that motion so we can redirect our motion. The next component of agility is really our mental component. Um, so this is planned versus reactive movement. Um, if we have planned movement, we can move faster compared to reactive movement because we already know what's going to occur. We can plan out our body's movement um, and we can achieve that position faster. That's one of the benefits of being on offense in most uh, field or court sports. You know where you're going as opposed to the defense, which has a reactive component. You have to orient your body and change your movement to react to what's happening from that opponent. You get better at, or you can improve reaction by practice, as well as understanding what may happen or tendencies of the offensive team. Um, so planning your change of direction activities around reacting to specific offensive plays can improve your defensive capabilities. Um, so if we look at these three major strength components, deceleration is a lot of eccentric strength in multiple planes. So laterally, sagittally, transverse plane, we have to be able to stop motion. We have to be able to orient our torso and our pelvis correctly to apply force into the ground in opposition to the direction that we're moving. If we're trying to change direction, we have to produce force into the ground and through our center of mass in opposition to the direction of our motion. So if I'm trying to move laterally and then go from left to right, I have to apply force into the ground to the left through my center of mass to make myself move to the right. Um, that's going back to our physics lectures or our biomechanics lecture on ground reaction force or that opposition force. When we push into the ground, it pushes into us in the equal and opposite direction. So we have to apply force in opposition in order to get ourselves to change our motion and then be able to stabilize our joints so that they move within the planes they're supposed to to avoid injury as well as um, give us the best chance to produce force and then looking at our planned and reactive based training we need to think about how we are developing drills for our athletes if are these drills going to be planned or reactive based on how that athlete has to play within their sport. Um, if they are an offensive player uh, that doesn't have to react, maybe you're looking at a wide receiver, uh, maybe you can use more planned activities because they know what they're going to do when they change direction, but you also have to include reactive activities um, because they may have to change their direction based on the defense. Um, so we can't just do planned activities, we can't just do reactive activities, we have to include both um, to really optimize our athletes' performance. And then with quickness, this is really putting everything together, um, how fast we can react, how fast we can change direction, and how fast we can create force. Um, so the sooner and the faster we can create force or rate of force development, how fast we can produce force into the ground, the sooner we can change directions, the sooner we can accelerate, um, and the faster we can move. So quickness is really the combination of our reactive abilities, our agility abilities, and our speed abilities. Um, and then moving that into plyometrics. Um, plyometrics are all about the stretch shortening cycle. Um, so think about how we talked about earlier with um, how we have elastic components, we have reflexive components, and we have conscious components for contraction within our muscle. Um, the stretch shortening cycle is a rapid eccentric action that's transitioned into a rapid concentric action. Uh, your reactive strength index is your ability to stop yourself or, or how long that amortization time lasts. The amortization time is the transition from eccentric action to concentric action. So how fast you can absorb force and then reapply force into the ground. Um, that is going to be the key for our plyometrics as well as our speed and our change of direction. If you are running and you spend a lot of time in amortization or on the ground, you're not going to move very quickly. It's the faster we can get off the ground, the faster we can create more steps. 
Same with jumping. The sooner we can transition from eccentric to concentric, the higher we can jump, the faster we can change directions, the faster we can move because we're able to get ourselves back off the ground and we can have higher rate of force development so we can produce that force faster. So this comes down to speed of movement, how fast an athlete can move, their strength, especially eccentric strength. Uh, we need eccentric strength, eccentric strength, especially at high rates of speed. So the ability to absorb force quickly and then produce force quickly right after. Um, this comes with training with plyometrics where we have to rapidly perform an eccentric action into a concentric action. And we'll go into lab about some example exercises or exercise choice for plyometric activity. But there are some warnings. Uh, these are more dangerous uh, from a um, injury standpoint uh, because you do have these high rates of force application, especially eccentrically, that's where we see injuries more, most often. Um, so if someone doesn't have the correct eccentric strength or enough eccentric strength, enough um, stability and enough body orientation abilities, so their ability to coordinate their pelvis, their trunk, and their limbs, um, we do have a higher risk for injury. So there is a progression to plyometric activities that we will go into lab to help minimize uh, those injuries. But we often see plyometrics within sport, which is one of the reasons sport is much more dangerous compared to training. Um, training is much more controlled compared to what happens in sport. Um, but let's go into the program design pieces. Uh, we will go into exercise choice within our lab. Uh, we have multiple different exercises moving from slower plyometrics into faster plyometrics. Um, things that are bilateral compared to unilateral. Uh, where we have repeated effort, plyometrics, single effort. Uh, we'll go into all of those exercise choice. With our exercise order, plyometrics should often be chosen first because they have the highest risk of injury. They're also the most neurologically fatiguing. Um, and if we do not perform plyometrics or speed training or agility training in a fresh, unfatigued state, we will move too slow, which then we won't gain this speed adaptation that we really are looking for with speed and plyometric type training. Um, we often want to last or give at least 24 to 48 hours between training bouts because the high level of eccentric stress can cause a lot more damage, a lot more soreness, um, and we aren't able to repeat those efforts if we're not fresh. Uh, the intensity has to be maximal, um, about 90% or higher um, for maximal speed um, activities in order to gain a speed adaptation. Our volume needs to be moderate to low. Uh, we, we want to avoid high volumes of plyometric activities. So we're not doing 80 box jumps in one session. Um, the comparison of quality from rep one to rep 80 is too large. Uh, we normally want a, a total volume range around 20 to 40 repetitions based on the athlete's skill level and ability. Um, and then we want to give adequate rest between exercises, between training sessions, um, because anytime we are moving at less than optimal, we are not getting that adaptation. And we will also go into the progressions of exercise choice um, and volume when it comes to our plyometric activities. All right. Thank you for watching. Uh, and we'll go into more in our lab.